Hi, everyone. Welcome again to another financial analysis video with myself, Moe Damin, and Ted Wayman. So let's get stuck into it. Today, we're going to be looking at Intel Corporation, right? So Intel Corporation, uh, very well-known business. So not much of an introduction here, but a couple of things that I thought was very interesting. Uh, obviously, a chip manufacturer, although it's not just chips that they're involved with anymore. Uh, looking at my notes here, they're kind of looking at things like motherboard chipsets. They do network interface controls, you know, flash memory, even graphics chips. So they probably, um, they will on some level compete with NVIDIA. And we did a video on, on that company as well. So you can check that out. Um, now they provide microprocessors. They provide their products uh, to companies that manufacture computer systems. So companies like Acer, Lenovo, um, Microsoft, there'll be Dell as well. So those are the main customers. Now, this company was founded by Gordon Moore, uh, and Gordon Moore was the creator of Moore's Law, which talks about the uh, the, the size and speed of the processes, uh, uh, essentially halving, um, well, the speed the speed doubling anyway, but the central halving of the of the size of the processes every eighteen months. So uh, very interesting that they, they, he was he founded the company couple of things in the news that are important as context for the financial analysis we're going to give you. Um, now, the chip manufacturing industry has uh, taken quite a bit of a beating um, recently with COVID and supply chain and the cost of manufacturing going up. And Intel, one of the companies that are have actually stuck with manufacturing, whereas uh, other countries like AMD have basically gone into chip designs to therefore reduce their costs. But what they've done is recently there were two new manufacturing plants that rather than fully own, they've actually sold a 49% stake in those manufacturing plants uh, to a private equity firm Brookfield. So essentially they're trying to manage the risk and share the burden of that very, very high capex cost. Um, and uh, the other thing was that they're creating what's called disaggregate chipsets, right? Important to know because rather than doing it all themselves now, they're taking different parts and creating what's essentially a disaggregate chip. So important to note that we're not going to cover the details of those things. That's for you to do. We're only going to be looking at the financial analysis and helping you become more financially savvy. Um, we're going to over, over, also cover the uh, share price. So stick around for that. And just to give you some of that context, you know, since their flotation in 1982, if you invested back then, you'd be sitting on a prof sitting on a profit of 7,889%. If you'd invested five years ago, you'd be sitting on a, on a loss of 13.73%. And if you invested a year ago, you'd be sitting on a loss of 43%. So in recent years, it has it has been hit. And we're going to look into the financials to see if they give any sort of a clue. Not necessarily the case because they are retrospective. They are backward looking information, whereas the share price is more forward looking. But it's good to see if there's any form of clue in there. So um, one other thing is this was a request from one of our viewers. Um, and so a lot of the videos we put out there are requests, about 95 to 97 percent of them are. So Kali here is your video. And if you're watching this and you have a company you're interested in, whether you're thinking about selling to them or investing in them or even working for them and you want to get more financially savvy about them, do leave a note in the comment section, put your request in and put some context or reason behind that request. So Ted, over to you. Let's uh, let's share with our viewers what we've uncovered about the financials of this uh, very well-known business. Okay, thank you very much, Moeed. And um, good to see you again. Um, it's been a while and uh, welcome uh, to all of our viewers. Welcome back to all of our subscribers. Welcome to our new viewers. If you are new, please do remember to like, share and subscribe uh, to the channel. Now you'll see on the, uh, on the uh, page, uh, on your screen, uh, that I'm now uh, scrolling through the annual report and accounts, um, and we are coming all the way down to page well, it's 91 of 140, uh, 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 91 of 140 pages in the document, page 72 of their annual report, which is where we will find the uh, actual financial statements, and that's what we're going to be looking at. And as Moeed said, this is backward looking. This is tells you where the company has been. It doesn't tell you where it is going in the future. And obviously, the share price gives a view as to what the market thinks the future might 
hold. Um, we can express our opinions on this channel, but we cannot give you advice. And if you have any comments, you want to agree or disagree, then please, please, please do share them in the chat. Um, but please, please remember to be polite. Um, OK, so here we go. Uh, we are looking at the first column here. To, uh, this is the year end uh, December 2021. They've got the 25th of December, um, but you know it's basically the end of December 2021. So we look at 2021 accounts. 2022, obviously not available yet for obvious reasons. Net revenue, we're dealing in dollars. We're dealing in millions of dollars. So their total revenue, the total sales, is $79 billion, 79,000 uh, million, $79 billion. Cost of sales, that's the cost. I'm going to talk in terms of chips. As Moeed said, they do other things as well, but I'm just going to sort of, you know, uh, you know, just use that terminology. The cost of sales is the cost of the chips that they make, that they sell, uh, and that is $35 billion, which represents about 45% of the sales price. So in effect, if you spend a dollar, on a chip, it costs them 45 cents to make that chip and they get to keep 55 cents, which makes it a pretty high profitable business. OK, so forty four billion dollars of uh, gross margin, gross profit. Um, they've got then the uh, the kind of the R&D. So quite interesting here. So this number here I've just circled. Um, this is the kind of the the SG&A. That's the cost of running the business, which will be things like sales and marketing, logistics, IT. HR finance team, I you know the, the sort of facilities, all those kind of people. Um, they also highlighted this line here, and I'll just pull that one out. The R and D. So this is a company which recognizes that um, you know you don't win in this game by standing still. So a substantial amount of money is being is being thrust into research in order to basically prove Moore's law um, uh, correct uh, and the fact that. Um, uh, the chips are getting smaller and faster. Um, and then this last line, uh, interesting enough, so this is restructuring charges. So restructuring, the way to think about restructuring is basically redundancy. They've got a bit of a business. They either don't want part of it or they want to change it around. Um, and they've done a substantial uh, amount of uh, expenditure there. And that could be redundancy costs. It could be um, you know, other uh, associated charges. And what's interesting about that, they split it out because you don't see tend to see that every single year you can see that you know there's obviously changes going on in the business but that kind of 2.6 billion is very big compared with the amounts it was in 2020 and 2019 and i wouldn't expect that to be repeated again in the previous uh, sorry in the next year 2022 for example so total expenses 24 billion giving them an operating income of 19 billion so 19 billion a little bit lower than previous years but probably mainly driven by those restructuring charges um and that uh, that uh, operating margin is 25 percent so uh, basically if they're selling something selling a chip for a dollar uh, they get to keep 25 cents after the cost of making the chip and running the business that makes the chip um they then got a few other uh, gains on investments um uh, and that gives them the profit for tax. You'll notice that there's a little bit of interest suggesting they've probably got a little bit of debt sitting on their balance sheet, but not a huge amount. Um, and they are paying tax because they're a profitable business. So bottom line, about 20 billion a profit, which represents 25% net margin. A little bit down on 27% in the previous year, but still 25% not to be sniffed at. This is a very, very profitable business and there's lots of organizations out there who would love to get anywhere close to 20 uh, 25 percent net margin so there is the income statement let's go and have a look at their balance sheet and see uh, their capital structure um so in their in their balance sheet um uh, down here uh, the, this this part here we have the kind of these are the costs the, sorry cost these are the assets that they need to run the business so the biggest number there uh, easily is the property plant and equipment so this is this is all the stuff they need to run the business and this will be all the kind of you know high tech computer stuff they need to manufacture chips or or to research um new chips um intel appears to have grown significantly through acquisition so i can tell you that because of this number here this uh goodwill uh, which arises in acquisition so when you buy another company you're buying the future income stream but you get 
their net assets and the difference between what you pay for them, what you get is known as goodwill. Um, they've got a few equity investments. So other companies, which you know they, they've kind of invested in, they obviously like the look of, but they don't own them or they don't have a majority stake. So maybe 20, 30%, for example. Um, they've got some other identified intangible assets. So this might be software that they've developed, for example, patents, licenses, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and some other um, assets as well. So uh, total assets is um, about 111 billion. That's the sum total of those numbers which I have um, uh, I've circled. 111 billion compared with the current assets. Now the current assets is uh, these numbers up here. Um, uh, and these are the things that we need to kind of, you know, which, which, which are either cash or going to become cash soon. So when we look at their cash, um, we really need to be kind of taking these three numbers together. Um, so they've got cash of 4.8 billion plus kind of near cash of 2 billion. And then what's called trading assets, which uh, I'm not sure exactly what they are, but I'm going to guess that that's probably bonds. Um, which is just, you know, for sake of argument, another form of parking surplus cash. So these guys have got, you know, basically a lot of cash. You know, that's nearly $30 billion of cash. Uh, they're owed about $9 billion by their, um, by their suppliers. So these are people they've sold chips to who haven't yet paid. Uh, and then they've got another $11 billion of chips sitting in the warehouse or work in progress waiting to be sold. Uh, and so if we add up all of these numbers, they've basically got about 60 billion of, of stuff, uh, which is either cash or going to become cash soon. Very cash rich uh, organization. Look at the bottom half of the balance sheet. We'll see the liabilities um, up here. We see I'm just going to scroll up there. So uh, here we see the current liabilities, current liabilities, amounts we have to pay soon. Um, little bit of short term debt. That's a bit like um, uh, saying if you've got a mortgage, some of that mortgage you're going to have to pay soon. Uh, they've got some uh, accounts payable, which is their suppliers. Interesting enough, accrued compensation and benefits will be some form of deferred or long term bonus scheme, uh, I would expect for the employees. And then other accrued liabilities, quite a big number to kind of put in this other bracket. So I'd be interested. I don't know exactly what that actually relates to. It's quite a big number. However, the overall kind of summary is that I'm not worried about liquidity because they only owe 27 billion, whereas they've actually got 58 billion either as cash or coming in as cash suit. So comparing these two numbers together to what's known as the liquidity ratio and is a kind of a, a, a kind of a rule of thumb to see whether the company can pay uh, can meet its financial obligations as they fall due, which is another way of saying, can they pay their bills on time? Um, in the income statement, we noticed they were paying some uh, interest. And if they're paying interest, they're going to have some debt. So there's the debt sitting there. Um, in fact, the debt is kind of it's these two numbers together. Um, so that's about, you know, nearly 40 billion, just under about 38, 30, uh, 39 billion of debt. Um, and then they've got some other um, you know, some other long term liabilities. Um, uh, and, and interesting enough, they've got this kind of this long term commitments and contingent liabilities, which they put in there. We can find out more about that if you want at note 19. Some total is that they have uh, uh, current assets, sorry, current liabilities of 27 billion, non current liabilities of 46 billion. That's these numbers all added up together. And so if you take uh, the total assets and then deduct the current liabilities and deduct all of the uh, the total so the, the non-current liabilities include that 33 billion in that you end up with the net assets which is the same as the shareholders of 95 billion so in theory what it's saying if you close the business down put all the assets on ebay pay off the liabilities you'll end up with 95 billion doesn't work in practice but that is in theory um, and this 95 billion is made up of the investment by the shareholders. So there's 28 billion being invested. And then this retained earnings. Now, this retained earnings figure is very big, 68 billion up from 56 billion, which tells me that a lot of the profits they're making, they're holding back into the business, but not all of them. Because if you remember, they made a profit of about uh, whatever it was, 20 billion. Uh, and this number has only gone up by about 12 billion. So they must have been paying dividends. And we can see whether uh, we're right in that by looking at the movement in equity. So we'll whiz past the cash flow, come back to that a little bit later on. Here's the movement in equity. We're interested in this column here, this retained earnings. Uh, and so we see at the beginning of the year, 
They had there's the 56 billion at the beginning of the year. There's the 19 billion. You remember that comes from the profit and loss account that we were looking at just um, earlier. Uh, and we can see that they are um, uh, they're doing some share buybacks of about 2 billion and they're paying out dividends of 5.6 billion. So the dividends, that's income to the shareholders and the repurchase of common stock share buybacks is uh, you know, effectively creating upward pressure on the share price and providing capital growth to the shareholders. And that sort of the sum total gives us to the 68 billion of retained earnings. So those are some important numbers there. Um, let's look at the cash flow uh, before we um, before we uh, uh, move on. So here is the cash flow, uh, and um, you'll remember Moed uh, and anybody who um, uh, is a regular viewer that this is my favourite number. So this one uh, down here, this twenty or basically thirty billion. This is the uh, net cash flow from operating activities. So not only are these guys very very profitable, they also have very strong cash flow. They're generating lots and lots of cash. Um, now, some of that is due to what we call movements in working capital, which is kind of this stuff here. So even without that, these guys are really generating lots and lots of cash, which is a good thing. Um, in terms of their, um, uh, their investing, they're using that cash, they are investing substantially. Now, in terms of this substantially substantial investing, we want to be careful. We sometimes come across it. Here it is again, um, that uh, these guys are buying trading assets and then selling those trading assets. Uh, and that isn't really investing in the company. That's just parking cash uh, over in a kind of, you know, like a deposit account type of thing. So we really need to kind of remove those from the from the equation and, and look at the core elements. But even so, these guys, you know, they're spending a lot of money on property plant and, 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 and a, and a, a uh, property plant and equipment um, and actually just uh, always interesting to kind of you know compare the depreciation charge they're depreciating existing assets by 10 billion they're spending 19 billion on new assets these guys are growing that is very much a net uh, you know a company which is net growing um, and then because of the um, uh, they're spending most of the money they're generating investing um, you'll see that uh, there is actually um, uh, they're also reducing their cash by um, uh, their investing activities. Uh, so here we see a little little bit of refinancing of the debt. Um, the debt has gone up a little bit, uh, and that's allowing them to uh, uh, pay the dividends and buy back their stock. Um, so overall, their cash will have gone down by a small amount, about a billion in total, that 1038. Uh, so they've seen an overall drop in cash, but quite frankly, Moe, they're sitting on so much cash um, that really doesn't matter. Obviously, if you or I saw a drop in cash, we'd be um, of a billion. We'd be um, surprised we had a billion in the first place, I probably. Um, anyway, um, so those are the key numbers. Um, nothing really to kind of, you know, to write home about. It's got, you know, very high return on capital employed, about 15% kind of what we'd expect in a, in a business like this. Um, liquidity isn't a problem. Uh, very, very strong cash flow. They got some lovely, um, uh, you know, their, their liquidity ratio, their, their, um, their, their acid test is strong. Um, uh, they are, you know, they're, they're, they're just generating lots and lots of cash. Shareholder returns looking very, very healthy. Um, and, you know, their, their cash flow is looking very, very strong indeed. So I guess that kind of brings us round to this kind of this market valuation, which we should be looking at. Um, so let's uh, look at what the market thinks of these guys. So you'll see here, um, I've actually circled this. Now, um, we were going to look at this company um, quite a while ago when it was worth 145 billion. And, and actually, um, uh, due to one thing and another, we had to delay our review. It's dropped to 124. So um, as Moed was saying, you know, if you if you kind of, you know, if you're one of the lucky ones who bought low and sold high, you'd have made lots of money. And if you bought high uh, and then sold low, you'd have lost lots of money. So this is quite a turbulent roller coaster ride. But I have to admit, I'm looking at this and, and this is kind of, you know, reflection on, on Carly's um, comment was he said, look, you know, it's got a P ratio of seven times. That's crazy cheap. And you know what? I am kind of agree with him. I mean, you look at this, this, um, uh, this seven times earnings down the bottom or the 6.5, this P ratio. Uh, and just to sort of, you know, to articulate that, 
that's the price divided by the earnings. So if you do the earnings divided by the price, turn it upside down, um, you get the yield. That's a that's an equivalent of a, of a 15, 16% yield. Um, the dividend yield itself is about 5%. If you include share buybacks in that, you're up to about 6.3%. So I reckon this is this is quite a high yielding company. And I know that, you know, this is going to be due to a pandemic and, you know, they can't manufacture enough chips and supply chain issues and, you know, the kind of knock on effects and, and maybe kind of recession. But I kind of look at this and I think that, you know, if you take if you take this as a kind of, uh, you know, as a trading pattern. OK, and I'm being very kind of, you know, this is what a chartist uh, would would kind of do and say, look, you know, the, this is when it, it's got ahead of itself uh, and it often retreats. I would say that it's broken out of the bottom. Now, it's either going to carry on going down. And I know this is not rocket science. It either goes down or, or back up. But I kind of feel it's looking for a floor. Uh, and this looks to me like, you know, a, you know, a not unreasonable investment, if that makes sense. So, you know, if I was to form an opinion, I can't form an opinion. Um, in fact, no, I can. I can form an opinion. I can't give advice. If I give you an opinion, I would say this looks cheap. Uh, and I don't know why it's so cheap. And maybe uh, some uh, of our viewers have a little bit more insight and would like to share that with us. But it, it looks to me like it's cheap. It looks to me like, um, you know, if you want to make money, especially in this environment, just buy stuff that's cheap. It may get cheaper. Don't stress about it. Tuck it away in your portfolio. Don't look at it for 10, 15 years. I, I, I'd be surprised if you haven't made money on it. That's that's kind of my you know, and in the meantime, you're getting a really healthy income. So, you know, kind of why wouldn't you? Um, so there you go, Moe. There is my kind of um, uh, my tuppence worth on Intel. Hope you found that um, interesting and informative. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's interesting to look at that. And one point to note is, and one of the reasons that's being cited as to why it's looking cheap. Again, these are opinions that I'm sharing here. It's losing ground in, ter in terms of technology or product advancement compared with Taiwan semiconductor business as well as Samsung. So that could be part of why it's considered cheap because it's 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 seen as uh, losing competitive ground. But those are my those are my thoughts and opinions would love as Ted said would love to hear from those that are in the industry that know it very well have been following this company's industry very closely do leave your uh, kind of comments and notes etc in the comment section share your thoughts with us. But that's the purpose for the show, right? That's the purpose for these videos. We're here to help you become more financially savvy and be able to confidently and quickly read and understand financial statements. So we actually uh, analyzed a financial statement of a well-known company for you on this video. So if you have any other companies you would love us to analyze for you, do leave a note in the comment section and tell us about the company and the reason for why you would like us to analyze it. But until the next video, thank you, Ted. Thank you, everyone else. Good to see you, Moe. Catch you later.